Hey, hey everyone. Welcome back to Strange Mind 6. I'm your host, Ruby. And today we're going to be reading Chapter 23 of The Darkest Minds by Alexandra Bracken. Now, before we get started, please hit that thumbs up button if you haven't already. And if this is your first time joining us, please click that subscribe button to hear more stories. Now, let's get to it, shall we? Grab your snacks, grab your drinks, lower the lights, sit back and relax. And let's get started. Just because Hansi had all that power, it didn't mean he actually used it. It was strange to me that someone who could influence the thoughts of others had been born with a personality that naturally drew people to him. I witnessed it firsthand when he offered to give me a tour of the camp. Hansi waved at a few kids in black around the fire pit. His presence sent a buzz through the air. Smiles bloomed on every face we passed, and there wasn't a single person that didn't wave at us or call us out some kind of greeting, even if it was just a quick yell. Do you ever talk to any of them about what you've been through? I asked. He glanced at me out the corner of his eye, as if the question had startled him. I watched as he tucked his hands in the back pockets of his pants, his shoulders swamping with his thoughts. They've put their trust in me, he said, with a small, sad smile. I don't want to worry them. They have to believe I can take care of them. Otherwise, our system wouldn't work. This system was something else. It's one thing to carve the PSI symbol into the side of buildings and string up banners over porches, but to actually internalize the message? My first true example of this came when the girl in charge of the camp's gardens stomped up to us on the main trail and demanded that Clancy punish three kids who she believed had been stealing fruit under her nose. It took me two seconds of listening to Clancy talk the situation out to realize that the way of life at East River wasn't built on a foundation of hard and fast rules, but rested almost entirely on his good judgment and what everyone under him perceived to be fair. The accused were three green boys, only a few months out of cubbies. The girl in charge of the garden had left them sitting in the dark dirt like ducks in a row, each wore black shirts, but their jeans were in different states of disarray. I stood off to the side as Clancy knelt in front of them, completely unbothered by the wet earth staining his own pressed pants. Did you steal that fruit? Clancy asked gently. Please tell me the truth. Three boys exchanged looks. It fell on the larger one, sitting in the middle to answer. Yes, we did. We're very sorry. I raised my brows. Thank you for being honest, Clancy said. Can I ask you why? The boys were silent for a minute. Finally, through some coaxing, Clancy got the truth again. Pete has been really sick hasn't been able to come to meals. He didn't want anyone to know, 
because he thought he'd get in trouble for not coming to cleaning duty this week. And he, he didn't want to let you down. We're sorry, we're so sorry. I understand, Clancy said. But if Pete is really sick, you should have told me. You said at the last camp meeting that the med stuff was low. He didn't want to take any medicine in case someone else needed it. It sounds like he needs it, though. If he's too weak to come to meals, Clancy pointed out, you know that when you take food from the garden, there's a chance that it could throw off the meals we have planned for everyone. The boys nodded, looking miserable. Clancy looked up at the kids gathered around us and asked, what would you like them to do in return for taking the fruit? The girl in charge opened her mouth, but an older boy stepped up and leaned the rake in his hands against the simple fence surrounding the garden. If they're willing to help weed for a few days, a couple of us will take turns sitting with Pete. Speaking of medicine, I do apologize, that was my alarm to take my medicine. But let's get back into the story, shall we? If they're willing to help weed for a few days, a couple of us will take turns sitting with Pete and making sure he gets meals and medicine. Clancy nodded. That sounds fair. What does everyone else think? I thought the girl in charge was going to stamp her foot in anger when everyone else agreed on that punishment. She was deeply unhappy with the outcome if the red in her cheeks was any indication. This isn't just a one-time problem, Clancy, she said, walking us out of the garden. People think they can just come in here and take what they want, and it's not like we can lock it in the storeroom. I promise I'll put it on the agenda at our camp meeting next month. Clancy said with one of his smiles. It'll be right at the top of new business. That seemed to satisfy her, at least for now. With one curious look flung in my direction, the Empress of Vegetables turned on her heel and marched back into her domain. Wow, I said. She's a real gem. He shrugged, absent-mindedly fiddling with his right ear. She has a valid point. If we start running low on food in the storeroom, we have to lean on the gardens. And if that's been picked over, we're in trouble. I think everyone here has come to understand how interconnected life is at this River. Hey, do you mind if I stop by and visit Pete? I smiled. Of course not. The little boy was buried under a mound of blankets. If the bare mattress around it were any indication, the other boys had gladly donated theirs to his pile. When his flushed face finally emerged from the covers, I said hello and introduced myself. Nancy stayed to speak with him for a good 15 minutes. But I waited outside in the fresh air, watching the comings and goings of the camp. Kids waved and smiled at me, like I had been there for years. Not a few days. I waved back, something tightening in my chest. I don't know when it had dawned on me, or if it had been a slow, creeping realization. But I had begun to understand that black, the color that I had, trained myself to fear and hate it was the same thing that allowed these kids to feel a small measure of pride and 
solidarity. You'll never feel alone here, Quincy said, shutting the cabin door behind him. We walked to the laundry building next, and made a stop by the wash house to test the faucets and make sure the lights were still working. Every now and then, someone stopped Clancy to ask a question or air a complaint. But he was never anything other than patient and understanding. I watched him unravel a misunderstanding between cabin mates, take suggestions for dinner, and give kids his opinion on whether the security team needed more kids assigned to it. By the time we reached the cabin that served as the cubby's classroom, I was dead on my feet. Clancy, however, was ready to give his weekly lesson on U.S. history. The room was small and crowded, but well lit and decorated with colorful posters and drawings. I spotted Zoo and her pink gloves even before I saw the teenage girl at the front of the room tracing a finger down the length of the Mississippi River on an old map of the United States. Kina sat next to Zoo, of course, frantically scribbling down notes. I suppose it shouldn't have been a surprise to me, but the kids actually cheered when Clancy appeared in the doorway. The girl relinquished the front of the room to him immediately. All right, all right, Clancy began. Who can tell me where we left off? Pilgrims, a dozen voices chimed in. Pilgrims, he continued. What are those? How about you, Jamie? Do you remember who the pilgrims were? The girl, about Zoo's age, sat straight up. People in England were being mean to them because of their religion, so they sailed to America and landed at Plymouth Rock. Can anyone tell me what they did after they got there? About ten hands shot in the air. He picked a little boy close to him. He might have been green, but... He could just as easily have been yellow or blue. My usual method of distinguishing kids from one another was failing me now that we were all mixed together, which I supposed was the point. They set up a colony, the boy answered. You got it. It was the second English colony after the one set up in Jamestown in 1607 not too far from where we are now, actually. Clancy picked up the map the teacher had been using and pointed out both places. While they were on the Mayflower, they created the Mayflower Compact, which was an agreement that guaranteed everyone would cooperate and act in a way that would be beneficial to the colony. When they arrived, they faced a lot of hardships, but they all worked together and created a community where they were free from the English crown's rule and could practice their faith openly, he stopped, pacing for a moment, casting his dark eyes out over his audience. Sound familiar? Beside me, Zoo was all wide-eyed. I was sitting close enough to see the freckles on her face, but more importantly, feel the happiness radiating off of her. I felt my own heart lift. Kina leaned over to whisper something in her ear, and her smile only grew. Sounds like us, someone called, from the back of the classroom. You bet, Clancy said, and talked for the next hour and a half about how the pilgrims interacted with native tribes, about Jamestown, about all the things my mother used to teach me at her high school. And when he had used up all his time, he took a small bowl 
and motioned for me to follow him outside. Amidst all the groans and complaints from the cubbies, we were both still chuckling as we walked to the fire pit where they were just starting to set up for dinner. I felt a number of eyes latched onto us immediately, but I didn't care. I actually felt a small thrill of pride. So, Francis said as we stood beside the office's porch, listening to the bells, calling everyone to dinner. What do you think? I think I'm ready for my first lesson, I said. Oh, Miss Daly. I smiled. A smile curled at the edge of his lips. You already had your first lesson. You just didn't realize it. Two weeks passed, like a page tearing from an old book. I spent so many hours of so many days locked inside Clancy's room, pushing images into his mind, blocking him from trying to do the same, talking about the league, Thurman, and white noise, that we both fell out of sync with the camp's schedule. He had his daily meetings, but instead of asking me to leave, he had me wait on the other side of the white curtain, where we were now conducting most of our practice sessions. There were times he had to go out and inspect the cabins or handle an argument, but I almost always stayed up in the musty old room. There were books and music and a TV at my disposal, which meant I never once had the opportunity to be bored. I still saw chubs at some of our meals, but Clancy often had food brought to us. Zoo was even harder to track down, because when she wasn't in class, she was with Hina, or one of the older yellows. The only time I really spent with the two of them was at night, before the camp's lights were shut off. Chubs, more often than not, was a ghost, always working, looking for ways to catch Clancy's attention by stitching up the kid who'd split her lip and suggested a more efficient way of harvesting the garden. The longest I sat with him was when he took out my stitches. Zoo, for her part, delighted in showing me what she had learned in school and the tricks of the other yellows that they had taught her outside. After a few days, she stopped wearing her gloves. It only really hit me one night. While she was brushing out my hair, I had pulled away to go switch off the lights, but she beat me to it. She snapped her fingers, and the overhead light blinked out. That's amazing, I gushed. But it would have been a terrible lie to say. I didn't feel a pang of jealousy and how much progress she made. I had only been able to block Clancy out of my mind once and not before he had found about what had happened to Sam. Interesting had been his only comment. While I saw Zoo and Chubbs every day, Liam was a completely different matter. The security team had him scheduled for the second watch, 5 p.m. to 5 a.m., all the way at the far west end of the lake. He was usually too tired to stumble back to the cabin after his shift and spent most of his days sleeping in the tents they had set up near the entrance. I saw him once or twice talking animatedly to a crowd at breakfast or visiting with Zoo at the cubbies but it was always from the window of Clancy's room. I missed him to the point of a real physical ache, but I understood that he had responsibilities. When I had a thought to spare, it usually went to him, but I was so focused on my lessons that it was hard to let my mind drift to anything else for too long. 
Nancy laughed, drawing my attention back to him from the window, and I suddenly wasn't sure how I could let my thoughts wander. He was wearing a white polo shirt that was emphasized the natural glow of his skin, and pressed khaki pants casually rolled at the ankle. Whenever he was out with the others, he was properly buttoned up, his clothes cleaned and ironed within an inch of their lives, but not with me. Here, he didn't have to put on any show, not for each other. We didn't. When we first started these lessons, it had been from either side of his ridiculous desk. It went like I was squaring off. It felt like I was squaring off against the school principal, not being guided through a PSI lesson by my freak guru. Next, we had tried the floor, but after a few hours of sitting, my back felt like it was ready to crumble. He had been the one to suggest sitting on his narrow bed. He had taken one end, and I had taken the other. Then we started inching closer, bridging the distance on his red quilt nearer to each other with each lesson, until one day I snapped out of whatever haze Francie's dark eyes had put in had put me in and realized our knees were pressed up against one another. Sorry, I mumbled. When I turned back toward him, can we go from the top? He found everything about me amusing, apparently. Take it from the top. Are we rehearsing for a play? Should I get Mike in here to start building props? I'm not sure why I laughed at that. It wasn't even all that funny. Maybe trying to throw my brain at his... For the last 20 minutes made me loopy. The only thing I seemed sure of was how big and reassuring his hand felt as it took mine and squeezed. Try again, he said. This time, try to imagine that those invisible hands you were telling me about are actually knives cut through the haze. Easier said than done. I nodded and closed my eyes, trying to fight back the flood of colors in my cheek. Every time he used my lame way of explaining how my brain seemed to work, I felt embarrassed, even a little bit of ashamed. He had laughed the first time I made the comparison, waved his fingers in front of my face like he was casting a spell over me. He had tried a number of different methods to try to demonstrate how to do it. We'd gone down to the pantry so I could watch him slip into Lizzie's mind and for no other purpose than to make me laugh, ask her to cluck like a chicken. Clancy had tried to show me how easy it was to affect the moods of multiple people at once. Settling an argument between two kids without saying a single word. At one point, we'd sat on the stoop of the office, and he'd read me the thoughts of everyone who passed by, including poor Hina, who was apparently harboring a desperate crush on Clancy. The truth was, he could do everything and anything, lock me out, push an image, a feeling of fear. Once I was sure he had even passed on a dream to me. I didn't want to feel like I was disappointing him. Not when he was giving me so much of his precious time. The thought made everything inside of me clench with fear. He told me to take it slow, that it had taken him years to master all of this, but it was impossible not to want to rush 
through the lessons, to get a grip on my abilities as soon as possible. It seemed to me that the best way to repay his kindness was to master myself to the point where I could stand beside him and feel pride, not shame in what I could do, until I could unlock his secrets. We were never going to be equals. He had called me his friend several times during our lessons and in front of other kids, and it surprised me how much I recoiled at the turn. Clancy had hundreds of friends. I wanted to be more than that. I wanted him to trust me and confide in me. Sometimes I wanted him to lean closer, to tuck my hair behind my ear. It was a repulsive girly thought though, and I wasn't sure what dark corner of my mind it had come crawling out of. I think my head was playing tricks on me because I knew what I really wanted was for Liam to do that, to do more than that. But every time I tried to slip into Clancy's mind, I was thrown back. Clancy had so much control over his powers that I didn't even have time to feel the usual disorienting rush of thoughts and memories. Every single time, it was like he had drawn a white curtain around his brain. No amount of tearing could bring it down. That didn't mean I didn't try, though. Clancy smiled, reaching over to brush my hair back over my shoulder. His hand lingered there. Sliding over to cup the back of my neck. I knew he was staring at me, but I couldn't bring my eyes up to meet his, even as he leans closer. You can do this. I know you can. My teeth clenched until I felt my jaw pop. A muscle twitched in my right cheek. I tried drawing hundreds and thousands of wandering fingers together, focusing them into something sharp and lethal enough to penetrate his wall. I squeezed his hand, increasing my grip until I'm sure he felt pain, and threw the invisible dagger toward him, diving in as fast and hard as I could. And still, the moment I brushed up against the white wall, it felt like he had reached over and slapped me across the face. He sighed and dropped his hand. Sorry, I said hating the silence that followed. No, I'm the one that's sorry. Clancy shook his head. I'm a terrible teacher. Trust me, you are not the problem in this situation. Ruby, 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 he said. This isn't an equation. You can't solve it in three easy steps. Otherwise, you wouldn't have accepted my help, right? I looked down as he began to rub his thumb over my upturned palm, a slow, lazy circle. It was strangely calming and almost hypnotizing to watch. That's true, I began, but you should know I haven't exactly been honest. That got his attention. The others... They were looking for you because they thought you were some magic man that could get them home. But I wanted to look for you because I was banking on the rumors that you were in orange and that you might be willing to teach me. Clancy's dark brows drew together, but he didn't let go of my hand. Instead, he rested his palm on the silver on a sliver of space between our crossed legs. But that was before I told you what the league was planning for you, he said. What did you want me to help you with? No, let me guess. Something to do with what happened to your parents, right? How I erased myself, I confirmed. How to keep it from happening again? Clancy closed his eyes for a brief moment, and when he finally opened them, 
His eyes seemed darker than before, almost black. I leaned him closer, picking up on a strange mix of sadness, guilt, and something else that seemed to be seeping through his pores. I wish I could help you with that, he said. But the truth is, I can't do what you can. I have no idea how to help you. I have no idea how to help you. Of course. Of course he didn't. Martin was an orange too, but he didn't have the same abilities I did. I wondered why I'd assume the slip kid would. If you tell me about it and explain how you think it works, I then I might be able to figure something out. It wasn't so much that I couldn't talk about it. It was that I didn't want to, not right then. I knew myself well enough that I could predict the choked words and teary explanation that would follow. Every time I let myself think about what had happened, I always came out of the other end exhausted and shaking, feeling every bit as scared and hopeless and horrific as I did when these moments had actually occurred. He watched me from under those dark lashes of his, a look of understanding quick to come, his thumb hovering over the pulse point in my wrist. Ah, it's Benjamin. I should have expected that, I'm sorry. Seeing my look of confusion, he explained, Benjamin was my old tutor back, well, back before everything went to hell. He passed away when I was very young, but I still can't talk about it. It still hurts. One side of his mouth curled up in a refuel fight smile. Maybe you don't have to say anything at all, though. We could try something else. Like what? Like you blocking me this time. Not the other way around. I bet it'll be easier for you. Why do you say that? Because you're not vicious enough to put up a good defense. Trust me, that's a compliment. He waited for me to smile before continuing. But you are guarded. You don't show your cards to anyone. There are times that you're impossible to read. I don't mean to be. I interrupted. Clancy only waved me off. It's not a bad thing, he said. In fact, it'll help you. Well, it certainly hadn't helped me fend off Martin. Can you sense when someone is trying to break into your head? He asked that, that tingling sensation. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. What should I do when I feel it? You have to push right back up against them. Throw them off whatever track they might have been on. In any, in my experience, the things we really want to protect, like memories or dreams, they have their own natural defenses. You just need to add another wall. Every time I tried to get into your head, it was like a white curtain blocked me. Clancy nodded. That's the way I do it. When I feel the sensation, I push back the image of that curtain and I don't let up no matter what so what I want you to do is bring to mind some kind of secret or memory something you wouldn't necessarily want me or anyone else to see and I want you to drop your own curtain down to protect it I must not have been doing a good job of hiding my hesitation because he took both of my hands in his again lacing our fingers Come on, he said. What's the worst that could happen? I see something, some embarrassing moment. I think we're good enough friends 
now that you can trust me when I say I won't tell a soul about any falls or public puking. What about streaking and eating playground sand? He pretended to consider it for a moment, grinning. I suppose I could refrain from sharing that with the other camp, with the entire camp at dinner. What a fair, just leader you are, I said. After a moment, I added, do you really consider me a friend? Or are you just saying that because you want to see me get my four front teeth knocked out when I try to play soccer? Clancy shook his head and laughed. His favorite stories always seemed to be the ones that involved me trying to pretend I was a boy or the fast food binges my dad used to take me on when my mom was out of town at a teacher's conference. They were so completely foreign to his experience, I realized that I must have seemed like an alien. Of course I consider you my friend. Actually, he began, his voice low. When he glanced at me, his dark eyes were burning with a kind of intensity that made him, that made me feel like my head was full of air, ready to float away. I consider you a lot more than that. What do you mean? You may have been looking for me, but let's just say that I was waiting for you. It's been a long time since I felt like someone understood what I was going through. Being an orange, you can't compare it to what the others are. They don't understand us or what we can do. It's only us, came a small voice in my mind. It's just the two of us. I squeezed his hand, I know. His attention seemed to wander, his eyes carrying over to the other side of the room, toward his computer and TV. I thought I detected a glimmer of sadness in his eye, a real kind of pain, but just as quickly it was gone, replaced by his usual confident expression. Ready to try? I nodded. I promise, I've been trying. Please, please don't give up on me. I was surprised when I felt his hands pull free from mine. Stunned when I felt them glide up my bare arms and over my shoulders. I didn't stop him. This was the thing about Clancy. The thing I was quickly coming to terms with. With him, I didn't have to be afraid. Not of what I could do intentionally or by mistake. I didn't have to throw up every defense I possessed to keep my brain's wandering hands still because Clancy was more than capable of keeping me out of his head. But Liam, he was something precious, something I could break with a single misstep, someone I couldn't be with. Not right then, not the way I was. Clancy leaned forward to begin his work. I leaned forward too, right up against his chest, where it was warm and smelled of pine, and old books and thousands of possibilities I had never known. I didn't block him on the first try. I didn't even block him on the fifth try. It took three days, and his witnessing almost every sour, cheek-reddening memory in my head for me to finally throw up some kind of defense. Think deeper, he told me. Think about something you wouldn't want anyone else to know. Those memories will provoke your strongest defenses. There wasn't anything left that he hadn't already seen, I swear. The kid could have been a brain surgeon for how sharp and accurate his pokes and prods were. Every time I thought, every time I brought to mind a memory 
or thought and tried to put an invisible wall around it, my defenses crumbled as flimsy as waxed paper. Still, he didn't get frustrated. You can do this. Clancy kept repeating. I know you can. You're capable of more than you'll admit to yourself. It was his strange badgering for some kind of juicy memory that finally produced my first actual result. Does it have to be a memory? I asked. He seemed to consider this. Maybe you should try something else this time. Something you imagine. It could have been my mind playing tricks. But his face suddenly appeared. But his face suddenly appeared much more closer to mine. Something you want. Or someone. The way he said it made me think it was a question. A serious one, cloaked by his casual voice. I kept my face impassive. Okay, I said. I think I'm ready. Fancy didn't look so sure, but I was. This particular fantasy had been creeping up on my dreams for weeks, invading the slips of time when I wasn't bold up practicing my abilities. It came to me in the middle of our third night at East River, right at the hour that separated day from night. I startled awake in bed, confused, as I listened to Chubb snore and zoo toss and turn. Every inch of my skin had tingled as I tried to process what I had just seen. If any of it had actually happened, if any of it might actually happen, this was a dream I could never share, one I carried deep inside my heart, tucked so far down that I hadn't even realized it was there until it sprang out at me, fully formed. It might have dreamed, I must have dreamed we were in spring. The cherry blossom trees at the end of my parents' street in Salem were in full bloom. We drove past them in Black Betty, Liam and I, sitting up front together, listening to Led Zeppelin song play. I might not have even been real. Outside of my parents' house were white balloons tied off on either end of white fences. Floating arrows that pointed us up to the open front door. William took my hand, wearing exactly what he had worn the day I met him, and together we walked straight down the house's main hallway through the pale yellow kitchen until we found the door to the backyard and everyone outside waiting. Everyone, my parents, Rams, Zoo, Chubbs, Sam, all sitting around a blanket my parents had spread over the grass, eating whatever it was my dad was grilling. Mom was running around, tying up more balloons, her hands still stained with dark dirt after planting all of the new pale flowers that flooded over what once had been a yard of plain grass. We said hello to everyone, I hugged Sam. I pointed out the birds in the trees to zoo and introduced Chubbs to my mother. And then Liam bent down and kissed me and there was no words to describe that. Clancy's intrusion came like all the others had before, first with a tingle, then with a roar. I had been so lost in thinking about the dream that I hadn't even felt him take my hand to start the trial run. I liked Clancy a lot, more than I ever expected, but he didn't have a place in this dream. There was nothing there I wanted to share with him. I clenched his hand back hard, 
and threw everything I had into sending my other set of hands out from inside me like a shove. His curtain strategy hadn't worked for me, but this one, using offense as defense. This one was maybe a little too effective. Even before I opened my eyes, I felt Clancy jerk back, sucking in a hiss of what sounded like pain. Oh my god, I said when I finally shook the haze from my mind. I'm so sorry. But when Clancy looked up, he was smiling. I told you, he said. I told you that you'd figure it out. Can we do it again? I asked, I want to make sure it wasn't a fluke. Clancy rubbed his forehead. Can we give it a rest for a little while? I feel like you just tackled my brain. But Clancy didn't get a rest. Almost as soon as the words had left his mouth, we both heard a very different kind of warning. There were, there was a shrill wail from the other side of the room. Once, one I had never heard before, almost like a car alarm. He winced, tucking his head down to escape the noise. Even as he jumped up from the bed, he made his way to the desk flipping open his laptop lid. His fingers flew as he typed in the password. The blue-white screen of the laptop illuminated his pale face. I came to stand behind him just as he clicked open a new program. What's happening? I asked. Plants. He didn't look up. One of the camp's perimeter alarms was triggered. Don't worry, it might be nothing. We've had animals step a little too close to the wires before. It took me a minute to realize what I was looking at. Four different colored videos, one in each corner of the screen, four different viewpoints of the camp boundaries. Clancy leaned forward, bracing his hands on the other side of his laptop. He reached across me to get to the wireless black radio sitting on the other side of his desk. He never once took his eyes off the screen. Hayes, do you read me? There was a moment of silence before Hayes' is gruff. Yeah, what's up? Came crackling through the speaker. The southeast perimeter alarm was triggered. I'm watching the feed now, but... I think what he was going to say was, I don't see anyone or anything but his next words had me ducking under his arm to take a look at the screen myself. Yeah, I see a man and a woman, both in camel, unfriendlies, by the look of it. And there they were. They looked well into middle age, but it was hard to be sure. Both were wearing what could only be described as hunting attire, head to toe, camouflage. Even their faces appeared to have been painted brown. Got it. I'll take care of it. Thanks. Get them to back off, will you? Clancy said carefully. Then he turned the volume of the radio all the way down southeast perimeter. Good. Not Liam's area. I let out a grateful sigh. My eyes were still on the screen when Clancy shut the laptop lid. Let's get back to work. Sorry for the distraction. I could feel my surprise betray me. Don't you need to go out there? I asked. What's Hayes going to do with them? Clancy only waved me off again. Don't worry about it, Ruby. Everything is under control. One crack might not be enough to bring a fortress's defenses down, but it was enough to splinter into two cracks, and then three, and then four. After the initial breakthrough, it, came, um, it became a mission of mine to find different ways to slip into Clancy's mind. I never got to stay for very long before I was unceremoniously tossed out, of course. 
but every small victory spurred me on to achieve another and then another. I could catch him when his thoughts were focused on something else, trick him into trying to protect one memory when I was really going after another. It surprised Clancy, but I thought it also, in a secret way, excited him. Enough at least to have me start practicing on others. It was like running downhill in a way. The momentum carried me through all sorts of experiments, big and small. I made a spectacular mess of dinner one night when I pulled each of the six kids working on it aside and planted six very different ideas about what they were supposed to be making for the meal, all at the same time. I had one girl so convinced her name was Theodore that she began to cry when anyone told her otherwise. It became so easy, in fact, to convince someone to do what I asked or suggest that they had done something they really hadn't. That Clancy told me it was time to move on to trying to do the same without having to touch the unexpected having to touch the unsuspecting test subject first. When I was getting there, slowly and maybe not entirely surely, but there was something almost delicious about the feeling, the same powerful swell of abilities that had once terrorized me, port and control. Every aspect of them became sharper, easier, but on the Tuesday that followed, we were interrupted again. One of the older yellows, a girl named Kylie, came pounding on Clancy's door. She didn't wait to be let in. I actually fell off the bed with the force of her entrance. What's this about you denying our request to leave? Tangles of dark curls flew around her face. You let Adam leave. You let Sarah's group leave. You even let Greg and his guys go. And you and I both know they have the collective brain power of a fly. The floorboard squeaked as I took a step forward toward the bed. Clancy had left the curtain open when he went to answer the door. So Kylie had a full view of me. She whirled back toward Clancy, who had put two pacifying hands on her shoulder. Oh my God, are you in here fooling around? Did you even look at my proposal? I spent days on that. I read it three times, Nancy said, motioning me forward with his head. He looked at her in the same calming smile and patience he had shown me since our lessons began, but I'm happy to discuss why I had to decline now, Ruby, tomorrow. And just like that, I found myself outside in the morning sunshine. The spring weather was still sporadic, cold and dismal one day, perfectly warm the next. Spending two weeks cold up with Clancy had made keeping up with the seasons bipolar tendencies even harder. I stripped, my sh I stripped my sweatshirt off and pulled my hair up in a messy bun. My first thought was to check in on Zoom, but I didn't want to interrupt her lessons. I tried to find Chubbs in the gardens, but the girls in charge told me in her bossiest voice that she hadn't seen him in a week, and she was going to rat on him about... She was going to rat on him to Clancy for the punishment he deserved. Punishment, I repeated, bristling, but she didn't elaborate. I found him in the next logical place. You know, I called as I stepped onto the dock, bread is actually bad for ducks. Chubbs didn't so much as look up. I sat down next to him, but it only prompted him to stand up and walk away leaving his bag and book behind. 
Hey, I called. What's your problem? No response. Charles. Charles. He whirled back around. You want to know what my problem is? Where do I even start? How about that it's been almost a month and we're still here? How about the fact that you and me and Suzumi are all off making friends and skipping around even though we're supposed to be working to learn a way to get home? Where is this coming from? I asked. Maybe he hadn't fit in as naturally as Liam and Zu had. But I saw him talking to other kids as he worked. He seemed okay. Maybe not happy, but then again, when was he ever? This place really isn't that bad. Ruby, it's horrible, he burst out. Horrible. We're told when to eat, when to sleep, what to wear, and we're forced to work. How is this any different from camp? sucked in a sharp breath. You're the one that wanted to come here. I'm sorry it's not living up to your high and mighty expectations, but it works for us. If you just try, you could be happy here. We're safe. Why are you in such a hurry to leave? Just because your parents didn't want you, it doesn't mean that the rest of ours don't. Maybe you're not in a hurry to get back, but I am. He might as well have shot me straight through the chest. I felt all of the blood leave my heart as one of his hands came to clutch his dark hair. I've been working so hard, I've been trying, and God, you didn't even ask him, did you? Ask him, but I knew as soon as the words left my mouth. I knew exactly what promise I had neglected to keep. Anger in me deflated. I'm so sorry. I've been so wrapped up in lessons that I forgot. Well, I didn't, he said, and left me standing alone in the sunlight. An hour later, I was under a stream of warm water, hands pressed to my face. The camp's washrooms, one for boys, one for girls were about as glamorous as an outhouse. The floors were the beveled concrete. The shower stalls, wood planks, and plastic curtains crawling with black mold. We used the rooms every night to brush our teeth and wash our faces, and once or twice a week to shower. But today, without floral shampoo and conditioner perfuming the air, I realized the carnivorous room smelled like sawdust. I stayed in there until I heard the bells signal the end of lunch. I still hadn't formulated a plan for the rest of the day. When I walked outside and into one person, I hadn't realized I was so desperate to see. Liam stumbled back few steps at impact, his wet hair clinging to his cheeks longer than I remembered. Oh my god, I said with a laugh, pressing a hand to my chest. You scared the hell out of me. Sorry about that, he smiled, extending a hand toward me. Hey. I don't think we've had a chance to meet. I'm Liam. And that is the end of chapter 23. Tune in next time for chapter 24. And let's see what actually happened to Liam. Did Clancy erase his memory of me? Or not? Let's see. And, as always, have a wonderful morning, noon, or night. This is Ruby, signing off.